can we talk about things that don't exist? That's the question I'm trying to answer on the 33rd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. My guest is a professor of philosophy at Tufts University in Massachusetts, and he takes a controversial position. He says not only can we talk about things that don't exist, we talk about them all the time, including mathematics. My guest is Dr. Jody Azuni, who's been arguing for quite some time that mathematical objects don't exist. And our conversation turned into one of my favorites so far. If you remember some of the earlier conversations I had on this topic, like with Dr. Williamson and Dr. Isaacson in Oxford, they took the position that mathematical objects have a real existence separate of our conception of them. They believe in the so-called platonic universe. My position has been, well, I don't actually think those mathematical objects exist out there separate of our conception. I think they're constructed objects. They have a mind-dependent existence. Well, Dr. Azuni rounds out the spectrum, and he says, no, they don't have a mind-dependent existence. They don't actually exist at all. So before we dive into it, I want to tell you about the sponsor for the show, Praxis. Praxis is a company that is looking for young, enthusiastic talent, people that are in college and realize that, ooh, the college experience is not living up to the hype, or people that want to avoid college altogether because they see academia is slowly crumbling from the inside. They take those individuals and they give them a nine-month program. It's three months of a professional boot camp that's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. And after you graduate from the program, they guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer. As I've been saying for several weeks, Praxis is exploding in popularity, and there's a good reason why. So if you want to be part of it, check out discoverpraxis.com. And on their homepage, they have a button that says schedule a call. Click it, set up an appointment, and see if Praxis is right for you. So this interview is yet another that I honestly can't wait to break down. There's so much material here. There's so much here to talk about. For some reason, metaphysics gets a bad rap as a philosophic topic. I don't understand why. I think these kind of conversations are a blast. So please enjoy the interview with Dr. Joni Azuni of Tufts University. Dr. Azuni is the author of eight books and growing, and I'm sure you're going to find what he has to say interesting and provocative. We like to use numbers all the time as humans. We use mathematical reasoning constantly. Mm -hmm. let's, let's call it indispensable. Indispensable. I think it's absolutely indispensable. Yes, and when we think about mathematics, or we try to formalize mathematics, we have all of these what seem to be self-evident truths. Two plus two equals four. So everybody goes, oh yes, of course, that's, that's a truth, and they move on. But what I want to know is, when we use numbers and we make mathematical claims, what are the actual objects that we're talking about? Is, what is a number? When we say 2 plus 2 equals 4, what is 2 in the first place? Okay. Um, I'm going to describe my position. My position is that numbers don't exist. I'm a nominalist. My position is that a, a, lots of things don't exist, but my first focus in my earliest work was uh, mathematical objects. And um, I became very interested in uh, the main reasons that philosophers were pushing for why they did exist, which was a kind of indispensability mm -hmm. um, argument. And the indispensability argument turned on the idea that when you formulate a scientific theory uh, to uh, make it work, and in fact to just to express it, um, especially in physics, you end up crucially relying on numbers in the following sense. You have all of these uh, there are statements mm -hmm. that come up. Right. And so the idea was that if you were going to use these theories in a straightforward way, assert them, use them to describe, the whole package comes with it, including the mathematics. And that motivated other kinds of nominalists to say things like, well, we can sort of factor the mathematics from the uh, physical stuff and exhibit a pure physical theory, which would then, um, then the mathematics would be shown to play a kind of instrumental role and we wouldn't be committed. Um, those programs all fail, in my view. But there's a more direct way of going after this, which is, in terms of the logic, there is a, a, an item called a quantifier that comes up in formal logic. And the thought is, 
what's driving this indispensability argument is that that item plays a kind of committing role. You use it, it, it corresponds to the there is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I suggest that as matter, as far as the formalisms are concerned and as far as natural language is concerned, this is simply not true. Okay, this is just false. In natural language, I tend to have lots and lots of examples of statements that we make that are true that uh, use there is statements, but we don't commit ourselves and we Can don't you give intend a few to. examples of that? Oh, absolutely. There are as many Greek goddesses as Greek gods. There are cartoon characters and animators who resemble one another. Okay, and that particular mm -hmm. one, the there is, is as it's sometimes put quantifying over both something I take to exist, namely animators, and okay. something I don't take to exist, namely <laughs> cartoon characters. Um, you and I might be in the peculiar position of dreaming of the same imaginary woman nightly. So we would say there is an imaginary woman we dream of mm -hmm, nightly. We mm -hmm. might compare notes. Yeah, she was wearing the same thing the other night, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are what are called hobnob puzzles kind of due to uh, Geech, which say things like, Nob thinks that a certain witch has poisoned his pig, and Hob worries that the same witch has killed his cow, where the speaker doesn't think there is a witch. And so there's lots of examples like this where uh, items that are playing these quantifier roles are nevertheless, fun the sentences are non-committing but true. And that's key. The truth is important. Now you have to, there's a lot of philosophical flanks to fill here. Yeah. <laughs> How do these things get to be true if there's no objects that are being right. talked about? And you have to tell a story. And um, how do these truths operate with, um, uh, with sentences that are this way? How can we have the kind of attitudes we have towards these things if they don't exist? Sure. So I tell stories about all these things. This is why I spend so much time writing philosophy, because the nominalist position, if you go this route, opens up a lot of other things you have to tell stories about. I focus, uh, and sometimes I go on the offensive in the following way. Is, is it okay that I keep talking this Certainly, way? Certainly, of course. Okay, I'm just making sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's something I call the aboutness illusion which I think very powerfully drives not just the, uh, uh, the need to believe in mathematical objects, but the, the need to believe in fictional objects. Mm -hmm. And the aboutness illusion takes the following form. Let's say you and I agree there's no Hercules. And let's say you and I agree there's no Pegasus. There's no object in any sense at all. So there's nothing that has properties. Because if it doesn't exist at all, it doesn't have any properties. Okay. Nevertheless, we have a rather unavoidable cognitive impression that if I say Pegasus doesn't exist, I'm speaking of something specific that doesn't exist. <laughs> and if I say Hercules doesn't exist, I'm speaking of something else specific that doesn't exist, not the same as the Pegasus. Okay. But if you're going to strictly say these things don't exist, th that's not correct. Okay? Now, that cognitive illusion, I think, drives a lot of very weird philosophical positions. Minongianism, views that fictional objects do exist, because yes. how, how else could... Or the hallucination, is that a di dagger I see before me? He's thinking of a specific non-existent object that's floating right there. This is very powerful. Okay, so can I ask you a question? Yeah, then? Anytime. So, so. <laughs> I have to ask you, I'm very tempted by this because if what you say is true, you can reduce the amount of uh, existent... Ontological things. clutter. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. However, we have to ask you what do you mean by exist? Because if we're talking about something, isn't a, isn't a necessary part of a something being a something is that it is. It is existent. How can you have something that isn't? Well, that's right. but. Keep in mind what's going on here is when you say, how can I have something that isn't? I can't. How can I use the word something to talk about what doesn't exist? I can, okay. but let's not put it that way. Let's put it a different way, a way that's going to uh, push back on this temptation, which is let's just talk about the fact that some of our names don't refer and some of our terms don't refer, okay? okay. So when I use the word Hercules and mm -hmm. I use the word Pegasus, mm -hmm. these don't refer to anything. And now what we're really focused on is the question of how can a sentence like 
Pegasus is depicted in ancient Greek mythology as a flying horse. How can that sentence be true if there's a word in it that doesn't refer? And that's a different question. And now I have to tell a story, and I do tell a story which involves something I call truth-inducing, which okay. is we, we, we do fiction and we do mythology, and then we talk about the mythology, and in particular we talk about the contents. And the way we do it is we formulate terms that don't refer to anything, and we um, uh, give them a truth value based on the nature of the story. So okay. that we can say correctly, Sherlock Holmes is depicted in the Arthur Conan Doyle stories as a detective living in Victorian England, okay? Of Victorian London, let's say. So we can say something like that. And now I'm talking about a sentence. I am not talking about an object. Now, psychologically, we experience it. A certain way we're thinking about just as we do with novels we recognize these things don't exist and yet we think about them so would you say then you can't reference Sherlock Holmes outside of a sentence or outside of a story or that well no you don't reference him period but there are sentences in which the word occurs which have truth values Okay, and those sentences get their truth values in some derivative sense from the stories. But you can compare Sherlock Holmes across stories. You can talk about Sherlock Holmes in movies. Well, okay. You can compare Sherlock Holmes. I can say Sherlock Holmes is depicted in all the fiction he appears in as far smarter than Donald Trump is depicted in anything that talks about him. Perfectly good sentence. Well, <laughs> so when you say one that's not true because of <laughs> as it turns out. Well, when you say stories that's depicted in stories, that's does, right. does a story have an existence then? Let for the sake of our conversation, let's take stories to exist. What they okay. actually are yeah. might be um, uh, words on paper, interpreted sentences, etc. I have very radical views about what ends up existing at well, the I end of the them. day. Okay, well, I have a book. <laughs> I have a book which, unfortunately, I don't have here, so I can't give it to you. But I can always send it to you if you give okay. me the address. Sure. Called "Semantic Perception: How the Illusion of a Public Language Arises and Persists." So that also focuses on certain other class of what I call cognitive illusions. Um, what's going on in semantic perception is the idea is. You and I have uh, basically language organs. I'm going to use Chomsky-style language here. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of what Chomsky has to say about this. We have, as it were, each of us has a faculty, a language faculty. What it produces is we end up competent in an idiolect, an individual idiolect. I have mine, you have yours that's going on here, they overlap sufficiently that we enjoy successful communication, but they're not exact. But that's not our experience. Our experience is very different. Our experience, you're an English spe native English speaker, you have an involuntary experience of meaningful words on a page. Mm -hmm. There is no object like that in the world. Okay, there is design, there is just um, um, uh, ink on a page here. Um, nevertheless, we involuntarily project that into the world and we furthermore have the experience, I have the experience that this has a meaning as well as, uh, you know, a grammar, but I'm really focused on its meaning and I am experiencing you in the successful communication as having a seeing the same thing that I am, just as I see you as seeing this pen just as I do. But that is a, a almost, I want to call it, a collective hallucination. That, that object is not out there. Okay. Yeah. So there are several things I want to ask you, okay. and then we'll get back to mathematics. But right. this is so directly related. That's right. Is your claim that what you could call concepts, maybe, right. that those don't actually exist? Um, I'm, I was focusing specifically on public language. Okay. A concept, if we think of it as a mental entity, I yeah. mean, concept in philosophy, there's a use of it where it's a kind of public entity. But, you know, concept, actually concept is this mongrel concept <laughs> that's used in all <laughs> sorts of ways. But if you're thinking of it as a mental entity, there is this 
Um, we have a psychological theory, a folk psychological theory, which uh, talks about all sorts of entities, images, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What that, if that theory actually refers to anything, mm -hmm. Or not, I'm not prepared to say. Okay, okay, it's the okay. reference part that I'm that I'm getting right. On. What I'm what I'm focusing on specifically here is that when you talk about a public language, which we do, and we talk about sent, we talk about English, and we talk about the grammar of English and the meanings of words that are held in common, and we talk about if we talk about the practices that we engage in, where we defer to others sometimes on the meaning of a word. I have this tendency to think of a tomato as a vegetable, but in point of fact, I'm wrong and it's a fruit, right? We're deferring to certain bota uh, botanical, I mean, I'm not going to say that right, <laughs> experts. <laughs> that object does not exist, is what I want to say. So when, when s the sentence, though, that object does yes. not exist, makes me think, well, then it isn't an object. So no, it, that, is, uh, it isn't an object, but we experience it as an object, and we talk about it, and we rely on it, and we communicate with one another. Okay. And, and so we have certain experiences which we indispensably have to describe a certain way. But if I were to step back and do linguistic theory uh, about this kind of public object or pragmatics or whatever, my theory would talk about public objects that would quantify over them just as if I were writing an essay on uh, a, a, a novel of Dickens, I would talk about the characters and quantify over them. And in okay. both cases, those things don't exist, even though I say the sentences will be true. Okay, so moving from fictional characters, do you also have the same perception, uh, 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 perspective on something like government? Does government exist? Governments, countries, mm -hmm. yeah. I have not yet started to write about uh, social ontology. I'm approaching it. Okay. Um, I'm intending to write about it very shortly. But the answer is yes. The situation is a little more complicated because um, there's a sense in which we, there's only, it's only a sense though, it's not absolute in which we take countries or think of them at times as composed of people or composed uh, 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 t uh, constituting a territory. Again, it turns out it's a very complicated notion. In fact, uh, just uh, so a notion of a city like London is very complicated. This is the sort of thing yeah. that, that Chomsky has pointed out and that um, it's playing a, a, a multiplicity of uh, ontological roles and it's very shifty but in point of fact uh, and so when you analyze uh, what we would be um, dealing with here um, there's going to be the only way to put it now um, uh, just informally is that there are aspects of it that exist and aspects of it that do not okay so okay whereas in a certain sense the way I want to analyze fiction is it just does the terms don't refer and uh, I'm going to say the same thing about mathematical entities okay so what I'd like to do is present to you okay something that I want you to tell me why I'm wrong because okay I don't like the idea of Platonism Okay. And I don't like the idea, well, I like the idea of nominalism, but I don't like sentences like, we can say true things about non-existent, right. non -object. Well, that's a misleading way of putting it. Okay. The right way to put it is that we have sentences that are true with terms in them that don't refer. Okay, so that, that is That's much more... That's the way to... With a much more precise you're right. Way the it. other way of putting it... Well, it's not that the other way is imprecise. It's that the other way invites a position, which philosophers have adopted, that, well, there are two kinds of objects. There are ones that exist and ones that don't. Or there are <laughs> ones that have being and ones that don't. Or maybe they, none of them have being, but then they are, in some sense, or have properties, yes. even though they don't exist and don't have being. Being. And I don't want to say any of this. All of this to me is crazy metaphysics. Okay, so, but I think there's another option here. Okay. This is my own position. All right. That mental objects have a mind dependent existence. So when we're talking about something like 
government, or we're talking about something like Pegasus. Pegasus exists, but what I mean by that word is a mental unit in my mind. Don't want to say that. Okay, so why is that? Why don't you like that? Why you don't want to say that is that sounds like what's called the use mention error. And so it goes something like this. Let's start with the keys on my desk mm -hmm. over here, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly have a concept of them. I have an idea of them. Mm -hmm. And that's a mental entity, and that's probably dependent on my mind in the sense that you're describing. Although, you know, I'm going to have problems with that, but let's mm -hmm. not worry about that because mm -hmm. that's not important. Okay. The crucial thing is that we want to distinguish the keys, the physical keys from the mental entity. Mm -hmm. So there's at least two things that we're talking about here. And when I say the keys exist or the keys are heavy or any other number of things about the keys, I am not talking about the mental entity. The mental entity has a different set of properties. So here's how I might respond to that. Right. And so I want to say with pe Pegasus, yeah. you've got the mental entity, but you don't have the Pegasus. So, That's the difference between the keys and the Pegasus. What do you think about something like this? Sure. That there are different types of existence. So you have a spatial existence. Yeah. The keys have <clears throat> the keys. Keys are spa have spatial, spatial existence. existence sure. And, and fictional and, objects have fictional existence. Or they, what I would say is they have a conceptual existence. They yeah. have a mental existence there that is not spatially are, located. There anywhere. are philosophers who, who at least sound like this. Yeah. As I said, you find a philosopher for any position <laughs> because logical space, surprisingly, logical space is as um, rare and expensive as um, apartments in Manhattan. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason. So you'll find every space you'll find some philosopher. I don't, I'm a, a person who thinks, and now I'm going to try to trot out linguistic evidence for this, that that's not how the word wor exists works. Exist does not have many meanings. Do hmm. Exist does not have many uses. It has, it is not ambiguous. Now, one of the tools I use for this is, uh, I believe it's called the conjunction reduction test, which is if a word is open to multiple uses, um, you can't combine them in a way, in a single locution, you get oddities. So here's an example, getting beer and getting up, different uses of get. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say he got beer and up. <laughs> right? Right. Now, however, recall the example I gave to you a little earlier where I said there are cartoon characters and animators who resemble one another. One use of there are covering both mm -hmm. two different kinds. And you can yes. also say the same thing with exist. Yes, I totally agree. That so, there, but, but what I would say is all that's reflective of is an imprecision of language that comes up um, in circumstances like this. So the, the way we clear that up is not by saying, oh, exist is intrinsically ambiguous. We just say, oh, well, we have to specify what we mean by the term. So if I say something like, you know, uh, Harry Potter has square glasses, yeah. that's a false sentence. I could meaningfully say, no, that's false. Harry Potter has round glasses. Right. What I mean by Harry Potter seems like a very clear concept. It's some kind of a mental unit that I can describe in various true or false ways. Other people might share that concept in their own minds. They can and there's going to be this overlap between your concepts and my concepts. But we don't have to say Harry Potter doesn't exist. What I'd say is Harry Potter, does, has, that term has no spatial referent. That term is right. just a pure conceptual Look, referent. Look, yeah. this is a view. Um, <laughs> this is a view. Okay. And you can even inoculate the view against the linguistic evidence. You don't have to call language imprecise, which seems mean. You can say, well, we're going to revise the language or regiment it. We're going to allow exists to work this way. Your metaphysics, in a way, is going to drive your revisions Definitely. in language. Yeah. That can happen. I'm going the other way. I'm going to say, you know what? I can get by without messing with existence. Now, parenthesis, I have other arguments about this. I, I have trouble understanding different notions of existence. To me, what you're describing is 
something that exists in the same way but has different properties. It's mental or it's in space and time. Hmm. And so I'm saying, you know, that's actually your position. Your position is actually just good old fashioned. You believe in different kinds of objects. Some of them are mental, some of them aren't, some of them are numbers. And okay. you're, you're labeling it. Now, I want to, I. In the, my back pocket, I haven't mentioned this, I have a criterion for what exists, which is not is in space time, okay. but which would sound like it would just blatantly beg the question against you. I have a position which is something like, um, if something exists, it's mind and language independent. We have to, we don't get to dictate its properties. It gets to tell us what its properties are and we have to find out. So you reject the category of fiction. Of all mind dependent. You say mind dependent existent is an, those things. Yeah, that's not. There is no such thing as a mind dependent thing, except in the following sense. And this is why I wasn't ruling out mental en entities necessarily. Um, look, I make a chair. The chair is, in a certain sense, carpenter dependent. That is to say, the chair would not have existed unless the mm. carpenter would have brought it into existence. Okay. I don't think that makes its existence dependent in any way, except causally. In the same way, if there was no Big Bang, there would be no me. In that way, I can see mental events under a different description, perhaps, as brain episode, as episodes of a brain brain neurons fire, blah, 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 that's an episode. And it may be, although I'm not positive this will ever work out, okay. and I think it might not, that mental, the, 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 the folk talk about ideas yeah. and impression will all turn into uh, episodic uh, descriptions of episodes. And then that depends on what episodes are. So that would be the way I go. Now, when it comes to, therefore, fictional entities, Again, I want to say what makes the Potter claims true or false is the, uh, the movie and storytelling discourses that have been created. And then do these sentences describe things correctly or not that are taking place in them? Not do they describe Harry Potter correctly, because there is no Harry Potter, but do they correspond in the right way to the sentences which occur in the Harry Potter stories? Okay. That's the story I'm going to tell. Okay. So what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, I think you can tell your story, I can tell my story. The where I would want to apply pressure against you in argument would be with my criterion. Okay. So where, when you think of an idea, right. in your metaphysics, ideas don't exist. Let's say. I might think of them as, as I said, episodes. And then... Okay, I guess that would mean... It, that it, they might it, exist depending on how I feel about episodes. Right. Okay, so, <laughs> so what would something like that be? Is it something like a brain state, yeah, ultimately? Well, or a, um, uh, perhaps a brain state or perhaps um, uh, a particular event of the brain. Because one of the things that's going on in the brain is that things are happening. And those are events. And I think, strictly speaking, um, for example, everything that I'm um, uh, um, seeing, et cetera, et cetera, this can be characterized. Not everything that I'm seeing, because I'm seeing tables, chairs, et cetera, but the act of seeing, as it were, is a certain, in part, a, a, an event of my brain over a certain period of time. Neurons firing, et cetera, et cetera, if that kind of language is still neurophysiologically accurate. Okay. So that's an event of the brain. Now, the brain does a bunch of things. There are events that occur in it. It's, it, it goes over a process of development. When new memories occur, there is um, neurophysiological changes. All of that would be the stuff I would end up talking about. Okay, so when you are thinking about creativity, human, okay. human creation. Sure. Because I have this wiggle room in my metaphysics for mind-dependent things, I would say something like, you know, I can actually conceive of, let's say, a song that hasn't been written or a song that's in my head. Sure. I mean, it's not been, it's never been 
fully there, but I can almost, in a sense, hear it. Right. I can say all those things with a language of like, yeah, well, in some sense, that song exists. That's what I'm referencing. That's what I'm super, it's like so pseudo hearing, but it, th th its existence doesn't have any spatial referent yet. How do you think about, you know, creative objects? Like, yeah, creative objects, it's going to depend on the object. Um, let's, let's, assume that an object is a um, certain the objects we're talking about here there are such objects are um, are, are time bounded they come into existence at a certain point they go out of existence mm -hmm. at a certain point and so and let's say these are the things we create this is a, a very simple toy model because I think there are things we create that don't exist in a certain sense. Again, I'm speaking in this uh, terrible way, <laughs> but I can anticipate, and there are things we say like, you know, the house I am going to build is one I can barely afford, mm -hmm. okay? And that's a statement about a future house, okay? I am able to refer to, um, there are real questions about, am I actually referring to it, you know, because it exists in the future? Let's say it really does exist, mm -hmm. and then I, maybe I'm able to refer to something in the future uh, at the present moment, and that would be an actual object that I was referring to. It may be the house never comes into being. In that case, I'm not referring to something, okay? But nevertheless, what I'm saying is true, because uh, one of the reasons the house never got built was because I couldn't afford it, <laughs> right? So what I'm going to do in these cases, and, and you know, if you think about the creation of fictional characters, which I treat as creation, those are the creation of things that don't exist. And what we're going to describe instead, if we say, well, what did the person create? metaphysically. Well, it depends. If it's a story, it's a bunch of sentences or it's ink on paper that's interpreted or whatever. And then it, uh, uh, it's something that we allow to accrue over time the way we would treat it. Um, in other cases, we're just going to um, talk about a practice that we can carry on of a certain sort, a way of talking. And that's what we're actually creating when we're creating these Okay. These objects. I have one more question for you, yeah. and then we'll bring it back to mathematics. Okay. For me, because I can, I feel like I can, I have a little easier uh, of a time talking about mental objects. Right. I could, in this realm, in, in this kind of non spatially existent realm, I can also throw something like, Consciousness. It's like, oh, okay, right. God, just a big basket of non physically existent things, or yeah, non spatially existent things, and I'm just going to put consciousness in there, so that sure. resolves any kind of problem. When you think of consciousness or, or the experience of awareness, right. or, uh, how does this fit into your metaphysics? Is this um, an, am, I, am I referencing anything in the world? Um, I, it's, that's really complicated. Um, and it, it's a little like government. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Um, I have not written about this. I have plans uh, if I live. <laughs> um, the book you will write in the future. The book I will write. Well, the way I've been going, I'm, <laughs> I'm like at eight now. So <laughs> there's a chance I'll get there. Um, uh, consciousness, I'm going to say, in some you know, we talk about it in a lot of ways and we have certain kinds of experiences and there are these issues about first person and about, you know, the way it seems to be, et cetera, et cetera. There are enormous puzzles um, here. And so, uh, and not all of those puzzles are puzzles about metaphysics, mm. okay? But as far as the metaphysics is mm -hmm. concerned, there's gonna be aspects which exist and aspects which don't. It's gonna be the same thing as government. Okay. Having said that, um, I want to stress again, this goes very little towards being saying anything very distinctive about what's going on with consciousness or addressing the issues that arise. Okay. okay. So do you see any qualitative categorical difference between consciousness as a metaphysical something and regular 
the regular kind of stuff, the keys, the, the physical stuff. Uh, what I want to say, as far as the metaphysics is concerned, there is nothing okay. go else going on. That's right, as far as the metaphysics is concerned. And I have a book coming out like in 2017 called Objects Without Borders, which already says that a great deal of what we take to be in the world actually is not there. We project it, mm -hmm. okay? This isn't even going near consciousness. This is worrying about things like what are called individuation conditions for objects and saying we project the individuation conditions. Okay? And that projection has no actual existence. It has no, there's nothing in the world that corresponds to it structurally or otherwise. Okay, that's basically the thesis of that book. Okay. So what, what's happening here is a great deal, um, what I'm engaging in in metaphysics is a, pro, a, a process that a lot, an earlier generation of philosophers thought was impossible and dating back to Kant, everybody thought was impossible, which is I'm actually trying to factor what we're projecting onto the world from what is actually there. I'm claiming we can do it. Okay, the Kantian style view is something like, look, mind and world are all bundled together. You can't figure out which part is one and which part is the other. I don't think that's true, okay? I mention this simply because um, in saying that what's going on in consciousness, uh, there's nothing more than what's already in the world, I had to add, Perhaps I was cheating a little bit in advertising a book, but the stress I was trying to put on this was there's a lot less out there than you think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. Okay, so now coming full circle back to yeah. numbers. If it is true that numbers don't exist, right? then what is your explanation for the incredible explanatory power and use of oh, these well, numbers. Oh, well that's a big, big, that's, that's what I, I, I concede. If you're going to be a genuine nominalist of the sort that I am, you have got to tell a story about what is so valuable about geometry, about, about numbers, and about so much other higher mathematics. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a story that has to be told. It's a long story, okay? It's not a short, it's not, it's not quick and obvious. There's a way in which the platonic story made life easy. Yes. You know, there are these guys, in fact, Plato's version made it especially easy. And the rest of the world kind of approximates it. And that's why you've got application. Plato's story had an application story built right into it. I don't have an application story. So I have to tell a much more complicated story. And one of the things I want to say is it's a piecemeal story. So um, when you're explaining, it, it really turns on the application. So like if you're looking at your application of geom Euclidean geometry to a table, the story you're going to tell about the success of the application is going to turn on the physical properties of the table and how they allow you to um, extract um, descriptions of the table uh, that are approximately right from the mathematical formalism. So you've got to tell a story that, that looks at the mathematics, looks at, what the mathem looks at what the application of the mathematics looks like in that case, and why what pops out is close to what is going on on the table. So that's generally the kind of story I tell, and it's got to be told in a way that doesn't presuppose that these things exist. So in particular, I can't tell a story of the following sort. Draw a triangle on the blackboard, and that approximates a Euclidean triangle. I can't tell that story because I just invoked the Euclidean triangle. <laughs> what I have to do is tell a different story, which focuses on the theorems of Euclidean geometry, and then are interpreting those in the physical application, and then cranking out results which are close to the results that are empirically predicted. Or do you, am I am I at all communicating? Because this is th We're gonna as I said, to, this yeah. is a long story. Yeah. You know? Well, so so let me ask you. Geometry is a great place to talk about this because, in a certain sense, the the 
success of the application is so visible in a certain sense because you've kind of got the physical item, big and large macro object, to do the comparison with. That's so, what makes it an easier case for me than other cases. So in geometry, something like um, the Pythagorean theorem. Right. What I really don't like is the Platonist approach where we're talking about the ideal triangle that is separate of our conception of it that has these properties and sometimes correlates to this world, sometimes it doesn't. I like the middle ground of right. thinking of what I mean by the Pythagorean theorem has to do with my own conception. It's constructed objects in the mental world. Now in the mental world, then you can preserve kind of the explanatory power of Platonism and you can even say think like universal mathematical truths in this with this constructed object. But if, when we go to the nominal perspective, the nominalist perspective, you don't have that. You don't have. You don't have. Do you, you have still, any? You still have concepts. Do you That's have any okay. universality in, of mathematics in nominalism? You, you don't have it in principle. The universality of the applicability. I mean, look, mathematics as a whole is applicable. Okay, and that looks universal. But it's an illusion to think numbers are always applicable not if you're dealing with um, jelly-like things that are mutating into one another. Then Is that might, so, though? Yeah, there, if there's nothing to count, then you're not going to apply numbers. Um, you'll, some mathematics will be applicable. I'm not denying the applicability of mathematics. I'm just saying, keep in mind, you've got lots of different mathematical theories, and they are often applied in different ways and they're not necessarily the same. That's all I'm saying. So I'm trying to tame a kind of impression that you can have is like, oh my God, look at this miracle, mathematics that applies to the world. And the right thing to say is a chunk of it applies here, a chunk of it applies here, and an enormous amount of mathematics applies nowhere. 20th century mathematics and 21st century mathematics yeah. is full of tons of mathematics that has no application. Yes, that, and I see Absolutely. I, I agree with you on that point, but for different reasons. Well, I understand. It's perfectly good <laughs> mathematics, and often uh, applications can emerge later. Um, I, I can tell stories about that. There are cute stories, but let's, let me not focus on that part. Let me point out something that's very unusual about mathematical concepts. Mm -hmm which is the interesting thing is if you think of the you can have an empirical concept of a triangle which is you know I draw this thing with chalk it, mm -hmm. the lines are irregular they have a certain thickness and they're, they're kind of thin but not really very thin and, and the angles etc and then what you realize is that if you use those concepts you can prove very little they are implicationally intractable the reason being the angles don't add up to a on, on, on something flat they, it, well it's not going to be quite flat and it's not going to add up to 180 degrees it's a little more a little less what you can actually prove is uh, very little and most of our ordinary concepts, even if they have rich semantic structure like house, like London, it's very hard to prove much with them. The crazy thing about this, the original set of Euclidean concepts is that they're implicationally tractable. All sorts of things can be proved. And that was what made it valuable. You could prove that the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees, okay? So one aspect of the advantage of mathematical concepts, this has nothing to do with whether they refer or not, is that they are implicationally tractable. And what we don't realize is that that is a rarity in ordinary language. Most of our concepts are implicationally intractable, which is why we find ourselves arguing with each other so much, even with perfectly sincere people. Again, I don't mean Donald Trump. I mean people who, with the best intention, using concepts are going past each other, finding it very difficult to tease out implications. And in philosophy, the same thing, but not in mathematics. And what's your explanation for that, though? Um, we, it's just a, it's very specific to the concepts. In the case of one of the things that you do is um, you are narrowing, think about it this way, the empirical um, notion of a 
triangle includes so much more than the Euclidean triangle does. And one of the things you do is you narrow down the scope of your concepts, you increase the chances that they're going to be implicationally tractable because they simply cover fewer cases. The advantage is that you don't want to get something that has no, not even a hope of an approximation empirically because then you'll have stuff that you can uh, pull out lots of implications but there's of no use. And as I again want to stress, there's lots of mathematics like that. You get something that's implicationally beautiful, you get lots of interesting results that you can show but it has no application. And the people have to realize there's a lot of mathematics like that. Modern mathematics, I think, in particular. Well, it, yes. it really started in the t 19th century. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it, as I want to say. This is not a, de this is not a plea to cut back practices <laughs> in mathematics <laughs> programs, and by no means. It's to point out something special about, about an aspect of mathematics. Um, and it's one of the reasons why mathematics became the backbone of physics, because physics, based on that mathematics, inherits the implicational tractability. Again, comparatively speaking, compared to ordinary concepts, which so, are just implicationally, they're utterly opaque. So something as simple as just a geometric triangle yeah which I have this imp I have a it seems like there's some kind of a mental unit that I'm talking about that I can make true statements about think of and it rather that you're using a mental unit which is enabling you to infer and you've got an image in your head yes. but that's not the object there is no object but you about, can do well, that if it is the image though can't we just say that the image is the object no because um, there's a bunch of things we, there's a bunch of ways in which we talk about mathematical objects that doesn't make the image the suitable relata. In particular, we're both talking about uh, triangles and Euclidean geometry, but my images are my images, your images are your images. That's, They're not the same images. That's true. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about anything. <laughs> but, we're, but can't we at least talk about the image? Doesn't the, that, sure, doesn't the we can image... Talk. And that's a subject for psychology. And one of the interesting things is that broadly speaking, when psychologists study um, uh, the concept of a number, for example, they do not get the numbers. They get something else. I mean, there are lots of literature on this, very interesting stuff, where um, uh, we have a number of concepts of numbers that are operating in us. We have an analog notion. We have, we have um, uh, tiny uh, one, two, three, and four that we can recognize uh, without subtilization. We've got, um, as I said, we can, we can sort of estimate large groups of people and other objects. That's a concept of number. We have okay. something that's coming out of the number quantifiers. But the actual mathematical um, uh, numbers are not instantiated in anybody's head. Well, so let me ask you. So I'll start with an analogy and we'll bring it back to mathematics. Okay. If I were a masterful artist, which I'm not by any stretch of the imagination, and I were to share with you a technique for creating some amazing drawing okay. on a wall. And I, I describe as I go, I hold the paintbrush this way and, and you know, make this motion and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You might be able to construct something very similar to what I might have constructed. That's correct. Could this not be the same thing that's going on with mathematics? So it what is I'm talking, the same thing that's going on in mathematics. But, 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 it, but if, that, if that's true, though, yeah. if that's true, it seems like the image is the object. The triangle is, the, 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 is like the painting that I'm... The, like, the reason it cannot be is because of this element that kicks in, which is... If you're talking about the image, there can't be any right or wrong. The image is what it is. Sure. But with mathematics, we treat there being a right or wrong. 
is well, going on. We've got a language practice and a proof procedure which in mathematics that puts conditions on what the objects well, are supposed to be like. But I can I think I can explain that. So let's yeah. say we're talking about the image on the wall, the painting yeah. on the wall. I can make false claims about it. I could say No, you know, no, no, but this is different. This is different. You, of course you can make false claims about it, but the point is you're not making false claims about your image. If your image, um, for example, con condenses the number line so that numbers that are larger are actually closer together than numbers that are smaller, which is how our number line works, mm -hmm. that's correct about the number line in our heads. That's not, that is the image. That's not incorrect. That's correct. Y yes, well, but when you say the number line in our heads, what I'm saying is the way I think of view of yeah. mathematics, it is, it is if somebody is a skilled mathematician, right. af as if they're a skilled linguist, they can right. tell rules and procedures and techniques right. to somebody to help them create a similar construction in their mind as the mathematician holds in his head. Actually, what they'll get them to do, probably they will not get them. You know, if I'm a not very perfectly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. no, something else is going to happen. I, let's say I'm a very skilled mathematician, and in part, I there's a certain phenomenology accompanying that. So I, I have ways in which when I'm thinking about certain higher dimensional objects, I slice and dice them a certain way, so I get certain three dimensional images which are mm -hmm. nicely connected to the properties of the thing. Okay, and I write down proofs. Now my proofs don't echo that phenomenology. And then I teach somebody how to do these proofs and they get the hang of it. They're likely to have a very different phenomenology, but they're going to be able to do the proofs the same way. Well, the core features would be the same though, right? Just like if, if we're going through, and I'm like to do the artist example, the rules I tell you are about making a, a, an image of a horse, but I don't specify the color of the horse. We can still make true and accurate claims about that constructed image, I can say, oh, you did this part wrong, he's, you, you drew him, he's wearing a top hat, right. no, but you've you done see, that wrong. In that particular case, you've got a drawing on a wall, yeah. which you're actually going to say false and true things about. In this case, you've got a phenomenology that never goes public. Okay, and when psychologists study that, fun, the only way it goes public is okay. psych psychologists study it to some extent and get some idea. But when I'm teaching you mathematics or you're teaching me mathematics, we are not sharing the phenomenology. Okay, okay. Now that's not, I'm not invoking another minds problem or you never get access to your from. That's All not right. the point. Right. The point I'm making is that you have to get on to doing the mathematics and there's no reason to think that you get on to it by getting the same phenolo phenomenology in your head that I get. Okay. In fact, if you end up being a really creative mathematician, using the stuff that I started with and coming up with all these new proofs, you probably have a very different phenomenology. Okay, okay. So let me, uh, you're correct to point out the error of the, well, the horse example. However, I have another example. <laughs> so, just like a real philosopher, he's just, well, okay, you don't like that example? Here's a, here, here, look, I've got six more in my pocket. <laughs> okay. So let's say it's not drawing the public thing. Let's say yeah. it's storytelling. Okay. And let's say I'm trying to communicate to an apprentice storyteller and I right. say, look, here are the absolutely essential features of constructing the story. Oh, good, sir. Here's what you do with the plot. Here's how Here's, you get the characters well, to I be say, liked. Here, here are their, their names and this is, like, yeah, this is the storyline. If I want to construct the same uh, phenomenological experience in you, uh, here are the key details. But I say, there are things that you that if you if, if the the color of the jacket that the person is wearing is different than it is in, in my phenomenological experience, it doesn't really matter. Yes, right. so we would disagree. We'd have a different phenomenology, but the same core meat of the of the story is still there. If if I've done a good job in communicating this, the core construction of that story. Yeah, I've is told you how to make the story, and yes. now you the, go on to do the same thing I was doing with the story. Yes, there's the some I, there's some irrelevant details. So right, but I, yeah. but none of this is really tracking the. Again, it's the same thing. The phenomenology is not really necessarily tracking it that closely. Um, it may turn out that. Um, I mean, what's going on in this case is 
we are learning how to create a certain kind of external object, which is a story, which is a bunch of sentences following uh, one another. Uh. And that's what it often, at the end of the day, that's what counts. See, I, I, that's, that's a good point because what I've done is smuggled in my metaphysics because I wouldn't have considered the story an external object. I'm right. considering it as a, that's why I gave the example right. to say, oh, look, but this even, is not an external. Even if, you, you, even if it's not written down, even if it's an oral, it's still an external object. Right. That's, and that's the kind of thing that's being passed to one another and that we're learning to make. And I agree that the phenomenology is crucial to pulling that off. Um, it may be, for example, that someone who cannot psychologically um, entertain imaginary beings of a certain sort and start to attribute to things to them psychologically is not going to be able to write a story. <laughs> right. you know, or if they do, it's going to be a really bizarre kind of thing. But nevertheless, that phenomenology enables them to do it, but is not showing up. So in conclusion, because this yeah, is an, yeah. an excellent note to end on, I was having a conversation with a mathematician at Oxford, okay. and we were talking about this subject. It came up fairly briefly, and he was saying, there is a school of thought. I don't know if you've heard of this, because I don't know very much about it, but if you do, I'd like to follow this up my, just on my yeah. own research. There's a school of thinking in mathematics and in metaphysics called fictionalism, which essentially says that numbers are fictional objects. They're yeah. in the same, which is, that is my position. They're I, like, I, they're like, they're, they're different versions of the story. Yes. And of this position. And what, and, and what I would say is I really like that, uh, that, that position because depending on the nature of the fictional object, the numbers or the, the concepts, you can create the story in such a way where you can make true claims about the spatially existent world. So when I talk about the idealized sphere, to the extent I make that a very clear concept, that applies to the real world, and that's how we get the amazing explanatory power right. of mathematics. Um, but have you? Is this is this a position that that there is not? Yeah, no, it's out there. Okay. Um, there are different things called by fiction, uh, called fictionalism. Uh, usually, the fictionalist position doesn't want these things to be true. Um, uh, at least among many philosophers, the fictionalist thinks that fictions are pretended true rather than true. So mm. it's often, okay. it's not invariably, but one way to think of it is as a pretense view. Um, I'm not a pretense theorist. I think that these things just are true. And it's the fact that they're true that contributes to their value. Okay, and what I'm saying is they, these sentences can be true in fiction just as in mathematics without referring. But it's the truth of them and it's the nature of the truths that makes them successfully applicable. So I want to avoid the fictional world picture in fiction, let alone in mathematics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't give the kind of explanation that you just mentioned, I'm gonna give a different one. As long as I'm successful in giving a different one, we can then get into a fight over the specific issue of, should we, do we need to have a kind of fictional object for our story or not? And I'm going to say, no, we don't. Well, that's an excellent <laughs> note to end on. Thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah, thank you. All right, that was my interview with Dr. Jody Azuni of Tufts University. I hope you guys liked it. I certainly did. When I edited this interview up, I thought, damn, this was a good one. I got lots more coming down the pipeline. My wife and I are moving to New Zealand to continue our travel around the world. And I got some new articles and videos that are coming out soon. So the next few weeks are going to be super exciting. Make sure to stay tuned. All right, that's it for me. Enjoy the rest of your day.